Hey guys, um, we're going to read chapter 11 today of Number of the Stars. Um, this book has 17 chapters, so we're kind of working toward wrapping up the book. Just a few more chapters to go. Um, yeah, this has been fun, kind of making some videos, so make sure that you guys get your reading response journals, that you're ready um, to stop and jot when we ask, and so you can participate in the book with us um, right from your home. So guys, um, chapter 10 that Miss Page read yesterday, um, we kind of ended with they were about to open the casket. Um, and so we know that the soldiers busted into the house and were demanding to open the casket. Um, and they are finally opening it to, so that we know what's inside. Um, and you guys made some predictions in your reading response journals of what you think is in the casket. Um, so we're going to find that out today um, as we read and see if you were correct in your prediction. So chapter 11 is, will we see you again soon, Peter? Will we see you again soon, Peter? So in my mind, that makes me think that Peter is going to leave. Um, where is Peter going? What is he going to do? Um, let's find out. Anne-Marie blinked. Across the dark room, she saw Ellen, too, peering into the narrow wooden box in surprise. So whatever they see in the casket is a surprise to them. They don't know. Um, we don't, we don't know yet, but it's a surprise. There was no one in the casket at all. Hmm, so there's no great aunt in there. Instead, it seemed to be stuffed with folded blankets and articles of clothing. Hmm, all right, stop and jot right now. Why is the casket filled with clothing and blankets? Pause the video, stop and jot. Why is it filled with blankets and clothes? Peter began to lift the things out and distribute them to the silent people around the room. He handed heavy coats to the man and wife and another to the old man with the beard. It will be very cold, he murmured. Put them on. He found a thick sweater for Mr. Rosen and a woolen jacket for Ellen's father. After a moment of rummaging through the folded things, he found a smaller winter jacket and handed it to Ellen. Anne-Marie watched as Ellen took the jacket in her arms and looked at it. It was patched and worn. It was true that if there had been few new clothes for anyone during the recent years, but still, Ellen's mother had always managed to make clothes for her daughter, often using old things that she would be able to take apart and refashion in a way that made them seem brand new. Never had Ellen worn anything so shabby and old. Ooh, that's a good word, shabby. Um, I don't have a whiteboard or anything with me, so I'm actually going to put that in the, um, the description of the video below, the word shabby. Um, so I want you to predict, what does the word shabby mean? Let me read this um, again. It says, never had Ellen worn anything so shabby and old. So we know that um, it says shabby and old, so we can kind of use the word old to help us figure out what the word shabby means. So go ahead and jot that down in your notebook. What does the word shabby mean? She put it on and pulled it around her and buttoned the mismatched buttons. Peter, his arms full of the odd pieces of clothing, looked toward the silent couple with the infant. I'm sorry, he said to them. There's nothing for a baby. I'll find something, Mama said quickly. The baby must be warm. She left the room and was back in a moment with Kir Kirsty's thick red sweater. Here, she said softly to the mother. It will be much too big, but that will make it even warmer for him. The woman spoke for the very first time. Her, she whispered. She's a girl. Her name is Rachel. Mama smiled and helped her and helped her direct the sleeping baby's arms into the sleeves of the sweater. Together they buttoned the heart-shaped buttons. How Kirsty loved that sweater with its heart buttons until the chi tiny child was completely encased in the warm red wool. Her eye eyelids fluttered, but she didn't wait. Peter reached into his pocket and took something out. He went to the parents and leaned down to the baby. He opened the lid of the small bottle in his hand. How much does she weigh? Peter asked. She was seven pounds when she was first born, the young woman replied. She's gained a little weight, but not very, very much. Maybe she weighs eight pounds now, no more. A few drops will be enough then. It has no taste and she won't even notice. The mother tightened her arms around the baby, looking up at Peter, Peter pleading. Please, no, she said. She always sleeps at night. Please, she doesn't need it. I promise she won't cry. Um, my question as reading this is what, um, Peter's about to give some sort of thing in the bottle to this baby and the mom is pleading, no, we don't need to give it to her. She won't cry. 
So why is it important? Stop and jot. Why is it important um, that the baby is not crying? So they're about to give her some sort of maybe sleeping aid or something to help her sleep through the night. Why is it important that the baby is not going to cry in this scene? Um, stop and jot that down. Peter's voice was firm. We can't take any chances, he said. He inserted the dropper of the bottle into the baby's tiny mouth and squeezed a few drops of liquid onto her tongue. The baby yawned and swallowed it. The mother closed her eyes and her husband gripped her shoulder. Next, Peter removed the folded blankets from the coffin one by one and handed them around. Carry these with you, he said. You'll need them later for warmth. Anne-Marie's mother moved around the room and gave each person a small package of food, the cheese and bread and the apples that Anne-Marie had helped her prepare in the kitchen hours before. Finally, Peter took a paper-wrapped packet from the inside of his own jacket. He looked around the room at the assembled people, now dressed in the bulky winter clothing, and then motioned to Mr. Rosen, who followed him into the hall. Anne-Marie could overhear their conversation. Mr. Rosen, Peter said, I must get this to Henrik but I might not see him. I'm going to take the others only to the harbor and then they will go out to the boat alone. I want you to deliver this without fail. It is of great importance. There was a moment of silence in the hall and Anne-Marie knew that Peter must be giving this packet to Mr. Rosen. So whatever is in this packet, it Peter says it's, it's very important. It needs to be delivered. Anne-Marie could see it protruding from Mr. Rosen's pocket when he returned to the room and sat down again. She could see, too, that Mr. Rosen had a puzzled look on his face. He didn't know what the packet contained, and he didn't ask. It was one more time, Anne-Marie realized, when they, when they protected one another by not telling each other. If Mr. Rosen knew what was in the packet, he might be frightened. If Mr. Rosen knew, he might be in danger. So he didn't ask, and Peter didn't explain. Now, Peter said, looking at his watch, I will lead the first group, you and you and you. He gestured to the old man and the young couple with their baby. Inge, he said, and Mar Inge, he said, Anne Marie realized that it was the first time that she had heard Peter Nielsen call her mother by her first name. Before it had always been Mrs. Johansson, or in the old days, during the merriment and excitement of his engagement to Lise, it had been occasionally Mama. Now it was Inge, Inga. It was as if he had moved beyond his youth and had taken his place in the world as an adult. Her mother nodded and waited for his instructions. You wait 20 minutes, then bring the Rosens. Don't come sooner. We must separate on the path so there's a less chance of being seen. Mrs. Johansson nodded again. Come directly to the house after you have seen the Rosens safely to Uncle Henrik. Stay in the shadows on the back path, and you know that, of course. By the time you get to the Rosens to the boat, Peter went on, I will be gone. As soon as I deliver my group, I must move on. There is other work to be done tonight. He turned to Anne-Marie, so I will say goodbye to you now. Anne-Marie went to him and gave him a hug. But will we see you again soon, she asked. I hope so, Peter said. Very soon. Don't grow much more, or you'll be taller than I am, little long legs. Anne-Marie smiled. But Peter's comment was no longer the light-hearted fun of the past. It was only a brief grasp at something that he that had gone. Peter kissed Mama wordlessly. Then he wished the Rosens Godspeed and led the others through the door. Mama, Anne Marie, and the Rosens sat in silence. There was a slight commotion outside the door, and Mama went quickly to look out. In a moment, she looked back. It's all right, she said, in response to their looks. The old man stumbled, but Peter helped him up. He didn't seem to be hurt, maybe just pride, she said, smiling a bit. That was an odd word, pride. Anne-Marie looked at the Rosens sitting there, wearing the mishappen, ill-fitted clothing, holding ragged blankets folded in their arms, their faces drawn and tired. She remembered the earlier, happier times. Mrs. Rosen, her hair neatly combed and covered, lighting the Sabbath candles, saying an ancient prayer. And Mr. Rosen sitting in the big chair in the living room, studying his books, correcting papers, adjusting his glasses, looking up now and then to complain that complain good-naturedly about the lack of decent light. She remembered Ellen in the, in the school play, moving confidently across the stage, her gesture sure, her voice clear. All of those things, their sources of pride, 
The candlesticks, the books, the daydreams of theater had been left behind in Copenhagen. They had nothing with them now. There was only the clothing of unknown people for warmth, the food from Henrik's farm for survival, and the dark path ahead through the woods to freedom. Anne-Marie realized, though she had not really been told, that Uncle Henrik was going to take them in his boat across the sea to Sweden. Hmm. So, as you're realizing all of these people are working together to try to get the Rosens and the other people to safety. So she says she realized that Uncle Henrik is going to take them across the sea to Sweden. Now remember, um, Sweden is free. They're not persecuting Jews there, so they'll be safe when they get to Sweden. She knew how frightened Mr. Miss, sorry, she knew how frightened Mrs. Rosen was of the sea. It's width, it's depth, it's cold. She knew how frightened Ellen was of the soldiers with their guns and boots who were certainly looking for them. And she knew how frightened they all must be of the future. But their so shoulders were as straight as they had been in the past, in the classroom, on the stage, and at the Sabbath table. There were no other sources, too, of pride, and they had not left everything behind. Hmm. Let's unpack that last sentence a little bit. It says their shoulders were as straight as they had been in the past. So it's talking about pride, and it's talking about pride and what they do and, and who they are. So it says their, their so shoulders, not soldiers, their shoulders are still straight up. They're still holding their heads high. Um, and it says there were other sources too of pride that they had not left everything behind. So what could the author be referring to in this book of the fact that the Rosens haven't left everything behind? Um, what might they have left in Copenhagen? And what do you think that they aren't leaving behind? Um, maybe take a minute to write and jot down what do you think that means? They had not left everything behind. Um, I'm going to go ahead and post all the questions and vocab words that I highlighted in this book when I was reading. I'm going to post them in the description below so you can see them. Um, anyway, go ahead and finish that stop and jot. Um, replay the video if you need to, and we will see you next time for chapter 12.